That's awesome. Well, with that, um, I think you know a lot. We have a large of our a large part of our audience here, so we should get started. So I wanted to start with um, as far as telling the audience who's joining us on the webinar today a little bit more about the Entrepreneur Challenge and and specifically why why we wanted to to bring David here today and teach you know our student entrepreneurs the the art of presentation caffeine so to speak. Um, but before I wanted to introduce David to give you kind of most of you in the audience know, but uh, he's a creative director for DBD International. His work has been featured in Adweek, Communication Arts, Forbes, Huffington Post, Business Insider, and Fast Company. He's ranked number three worldwide on clout for branding, as well as being the top 5% of presenters on SlideShare with over 870,000 views. Worldwide for his presentation on branding, design, influences, influence, rebranding, brand strategy, and entrepreneurship. What, brand, what Dave, David's What is Branding video went viral on YouTube with over 323,000 views worldwide. Shark Tank star and New York Times bestseller Damon John says, David Breyer is brilliant with branding and presented David with the presidential ambassador for global entrepreneurship medallion. So I actually, uh, uh, I actually discovered David uh, when I was actually going through branding for my own company. Uh, it was uh, a very relevant topic. I had gone through many different resources, and when I came across David's stuff, I was just blown away. And I thought, you know what, I just got to talk to this guy. Uh, and I thought it would be fantastic to not only have, you know, be able to learn, learn from him, but have him teach others, especially student entrepreneurs. So it takes me into talking about the Entrepreneur Challenge. Uh, we're an organization that's been around for 10 years. Uh, we do the annual business plan competitions. We've given over a million dollars away. Uh, the companies have gone over, gone over to be valued over $1.2 billion. Uh, so, you know, a tremendous amount of uh, great successes. And we essentially do run workshops for these student entrepreneurs to help them grow their company. So, there's ideas from later stage to even just the, the concept stage. And uh, one of the you know, things that we do is do the presentations. But in the past, if we don't really kind of give them the advice, the students the advice, then the presentations can be pretty boring. And so I spoke with David about creating this specific workshop geared towards what the, the title perfectly illustrates, which David came up with, which was Presentation Caffeine. The key ingredient to keeping your audience awake, engaged, and wanting more. So with that, I'm going to give the floor to David. Very, very good. Thank you so much, Alex. All right. So I'm going to, be, I'm going to do this very snap and pop. I'm going to, now, I am a native New Yorker. I'm, I live and work now in the Midwest, but I do talk fast. So if you find that I am talking too fast or you don't get something, that one is on you to say, hey, Send a little message to Alex, say, Alex, what did he just say? I didn't get it. And I will absolutely clarify it, okay? So, as Alex said, it is presentation caffeine, the key ingredient to keep your audience awake, engaged, and wanting more. Now, a couple of things. One thing you should know is that somewhere in the world, someone is being bored to death, sitting through a presentation that sucks. That ends now. There's two ways that you can watch this, this particular presentation. One is sort of um, looking for what are the golden nuggets that I can now make notes about and those notes are going to make the difference. And I, if I follow those rules and things, that that makes the difference. And I want to clarify that because that will not give you a great way to use this information. So first thing is rules enable you to follow. That's the thing. Rules enable you to follow. Whereas, knowledge enables you to lead. So I'm distinguishing between rules and knowledge. Rules, basically it's like, oh, what do I do? I do, I do one, and then I follow that with two, and I follow that with three. Now here's the problem with that. I find the majority of business owners, entrepreneurs, even business leaders, very successful ones, the information that is least useful to them is information that they haven't actually thought through. It's kind of like, oh, A, B, C, D. But they don't know why you do that. What's the reason that that works or doesn't work? And why am I going to make sure to follow those particular points? That is what I go over. 
So knowledge, on the other hand, knowledge enables you to lead. Knowing, oh, you know what? When, and when I'm speaking to someone in a sales call and this happens, I should actually do this. And here's the reason why. As opposed to sitting there, and, and I can guarantee, here's just like a quick little way to make this real. I'm sure we've all been sold something by someone in some store. This is the best way to do it in an interpersonal way. Some store, I don't care whether it's shoes, clothing, sports gear, computer stuff, a car, it doesn't matter. But I'm sure we all experienced someone who you knew, they didn't know what the hell they were talking about, but you knew that they were kind of going through the motions because that's what they were told to do. And that was horribly painful. So can you, can I just get a couple of some confirmations to send to Alex? Have you experienced that? Alex, are we hearing anybody? I have all the time. Okay. <laughs> okay. Cool. So we move on to this particular point. We're going to be talking about branding and purpose or how to influence and guide universes you didn't think were yours to control. When I talk about universes, I'm talking about we each have different people that we serve, that we're of value to. So that's going to be your audience. Some of you might have a product or a service or a business concept that's geared to service moms or women over a certain age or foodies or technology enthusiasts or young people who are into extreme sports, whatever. In other words, each of those is a universe. And so the whole concept here is how to influence and guide universes you didn't think were yours to control. And this totally dovetails branding and purpose together. Branding and purpose, and we'll elaborate as to why. A brand is a story. And your story is your brand. So, question becomes, what do great brands do differently? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> and it's a little, there we go. So great brands are built on purposes, not stuff. Now, what do I mean, what do I mean by that? Well, let's take one of the most well-known brands, Nike. Did they ever say, hey, buy our synthetic shoes? No. They said, just do it. All of their, their entire brand is built on the aspiration, right? That just do it was so brilliant because it didn't matter if you were 80 years old and walked a mile a day or if you were training for the Olympics, just do it was like knock off the excuses and just do it. And that set the stage for them to talk about everything. It, they, could, they could show someone running, doing a, doing a sprint or, or pole vaulting or doing anything or even just walking. It may it, take charge, okay? So ignore purposes and your presentation dies. That's the thing. You're building it on purposes. Why is someone choosing? Why would someone want your product? Why would someone want your service? What's the passion that you can connect to? That's a purpose. Ignore that and you're selling stuff. What does that mean really? That means you've turned it into a transaction. You have two options. You're either gonna have a transactional relationship or a transformational relationship. You want the transformational relationship. Because otherwise, if you have a transactional relationship where you're just selling your stuff, the inevitable outcome of that is someone's gonna say, whoa, well, that's just whatever, that's X, Y, Z, whatever, it's a commodity, it doesn't have any, that much value, I'll just find the one that's cheapest. You see, that's what happens. That's the road that goes down, not because people are cheap, but because you and I blew it when it came to defining what that value was, what that transformation was that we made possible. So with that, I wanted to share with you the video. This has gotten over 337,000 views on YouTube. And this is nothing, there are no cats in this video, okay? There's no unusual creatures, there's no weird accidents, and there's no people, you know, during spring break doing unusual things that people like to observe. So this is about branding. And it's about two minutes long. And I want to play it for you just to set the stage. What is branding? As creators, we want to think it's about us. Our brilliant talent. 
our skills we perfected over the years. All these magical things, color, space, shape, tension, harmony, typography, beauty, simplicity. Then why do certain brands become great brands? Brands that connect, resonate, and spread like wildfire. It's because we tapped into our ability to see, not as ourselves, but as others. To see the minute details and trends others don't see, not just on the computer screen, or in books, or in galleries, but in and through the eyes, hearts, and minds of people. Geniuses have that special skill to look at the universe of people and translate that into the universe of visual and written communications, to transform those observations we each sense into something we can each tangibly see and understand. That is the magic. That is the spark. That is the genius that gets each of us interested and keeps us going for something greater for something previously impossible, for something nobody ever thought of before. That is the magic of branding. So that is the video that went viral and it really sets the stage for a lot of what we were talking about. So the key question is, is how many barriers stand in the way of this powerful presentation ingredient, this element of purpose that I've been talking about? Well, four. So these four landmines, they will literally, they will wipe out your chances of success. Seriously. You ignore these, then your own peril. They are one, interest, two, ownership, three, cliches, and four, noise. And I'm gonna go into each of these so you really get the idea. So primary, primary barrier number one is interest. You have to be passionately interested in who you're speaking to and what they care about. And again, I'll just use, I, I tend to use examples of people to people because that way it, we can take these sort of potentially abstract and tie it into something real that we've all spoken to people, dealt with people, et cetera. Okay. Now the thing with communication is it goes both ways, but have you ever gone out with somebody could be a friend, could be a date um, who only wanted to speak about themselves, never had any interest in you. Or even worse, if you've ever gone out on a blind date or a first date with somebody and they only spoke about themselves, that check could not come fast enough. Well, that's basically what happens with interest. Okay, We need to be interested in the people that we're talking about. When it comes to branding, we need to be interested in the audience. What are their values? It's not a personal exercise for our own entertainment or gratification. Of course, we need to be passionately engaged and care about it, but we need to be interested in the recipient. Primary barrier number two, ownership. You have to know this isn't your show. It's theirs. Own that. You exist for them. You exist for them. Primary barrier number three, cliches. Now, Let's get cliches clear in our own heads. A phrase or opinion that's overused and betrays a lack of original thought. Okay, that's definition number one. Definition of two, very predictable or unoriginal thing or person. Now the thing about this is that this applies to not only to words. And oftentimes people think, oh, you know, yeah, cliche. So we don't want to, like if everybody in our industry is saying uh, we're, that we're state of the, that, we're state of the art, that that's what their claim is to differentiate themselves, then to say that would, all, would be a cliche, we wouldn't want to use it. That's true. But if at the same time, all of your competitors are using the same type of clip art, 
or the same type of uh, visuals or the same type of channels or the same type of messaging or the same type of inspirational videos. You know, that it's like, you know, they talk about hope and inspiration and challenges and achievement and potential and, you know, just words. At a certain point, words become meaningless. Now, I know that I'm talking to a younger audience, but to give you an example, 30 years ago, the term all natural, when it first started to appear, actually probably 35 years ago, when all natural started to appear on, on food packages, it actually meant something. It was, it was, it, it hadn't, it's not something that's been around for 50, 60, 70 years. That was a new distinction because the whole, as an outgrowth of the 60s, you had, you had individuals who were really into health, food, and granola, and things that were good for your body, and this, that, the other. Okay, so you had things that are generally on the fringe. The cycle works this way. Things that are on the fringe start to become more mainstream. We find things on the menus of, um, Arby's and the menus of Wendy's and the menus of McDonald's and Burger King today that we wouldn't have even thought possible seven years ago. We find certain exotic, you know, spices and we chipotle this and, you know, Korean that and blah, 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 blah. You know, so you get all these things that are on the fringe. They eventually, so today's innovation will become tomorrow's normal. So you want to be hit to that. You want to be sensitive to that, but cliches, apply to words, visuals, pitches, video styles, all of these things, everything can be a cliche. If you walk in in a particular way, like, let's say you do a pitch, let's say you're pitching stuff and you do it the same way. Why are you doing the same way as everybody else? Can you shake it up? Can you do it a different way? You don't want to go down the road of cliches. And here's the, here's the law. If you're using cliches to promote your brand, you're promoting your category, not your brand. If you're saying, in other words, if you're saying the same stuff as everyone else in your industry, you're reminding the audience of your industry. You're not promoting your brand. I don't care how enthusiastic you are about it, doesn't matter. So using cliches will literally, you might as well just be throwing money out the window because you will have to spend easily 10 to 20 more times to even make a dent because you sound like everyone else. So using cliches prevents any purpose from being understood or relevant. Now, primary barrier number four, noise. If everyone is screaming, do you scream more? Do you scream louder? Or do you not scream at all? You have to be aware of the noise level of what's going on. If everyone is in your industry is, let's say they're all using a particular channel, they're all like, you know what? We're gonna all go on, we're gonna all go and do Facebook ads with these kinds of messages, blah, 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 blah. Well, maybe you need to be the anti-Facebook ad company. Maybe you need to take a different channel and get the recognition that you deserve. That's just an example, but that's a distribution example. When it comes to branding, I'm talking to folks, I'm more focused on the messaging point. What's your message? What's your distinction? But that's just an example. But I'll, I'll, give, you, I'll give you a, for instance, a very specific one. I recently branded a PR firm out of Florida, and we found that big companies hate, they actually dislike PR agencies because a lot of the PR agencies, they promise the moon, but they deliver, they barely deliver. So what happens is when you say you're a PR firm, it's kind of like, ugh, it's kind of like saying, I am a lawyer and expecting someone on the other side to hearing that to be happy. It's not a, it's, you know, it's like, it's still kind of a more of a necessary evil. So what we did is we actually positioned them as the anti-PR PR firm. The first line in their presentation, their sales presentation, and you can find this on our website. It's a Joto PR, J-O-T-O-P-R. But the first line in their sales presentation when they actually do a presentation to a company is, we hate PR. And immediately, why do we say that? For shock value? Well, there's nothing wrong with having an icebreaker, but it wasn't just for shock value. It's actually for the reason that that matched the, the objection and the reality of the audience. They were like, yeah, us too. <laughs> Immediately bonded. And now we actually can connect on their purpose because people like to get PR. They just don't like to be promised the moon and ripped off when they're dealing with PR. So you must assess noise level. I, I just, oh, David, I wanted to stop you real quick. To, uh, one, one comment. 
Um, someone said, I'm, I'm a PR firm and this is so true. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Beautiful. Beautiful. There we go. So are there many promises in this space? Right? Does the customer have too many choices? That's oftentimes very, you know, if you're in a space, if you're in a space where there's so many choices, simplicity is king. I mean, look, look at the most valuable company on the planet. They have an iPhone, they have an iPad. They don't have, it's not like they've got 70 different or even eight or 10 different blah, 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 blah. You know, they have a couple of config, you know, configurations, this or the plus and blah, 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 blah. So, you know, it's simplicity. We live in a very noisy world. Simplicity rules. Are the differences between the options too subtle? You, may, you have to always look with regard to your messaging. Is the, is the point we're making really clear? Does it really, really, really isolate who and what we are? So that's just an example that you want to make sure that it's really, that the difference is not so subtle that you have to put it under a microscope to go, oh, I see now. People don't have time. And people usually are not walking around with a microscope. So, failure to do any of the four, interest, ownership, cliches, or noise, will result in a failure to differentiate. Now, that brings us to this particular point, the definition for branding. Here's an example. Which bottle did you notice first? Everyone says, well, the green one, obviously. Well, it's not so obvious. There are three amber ones, one green one. Why? There should be a three to one ratio that you would have noticed the amber ones first. But everyone goes, oh, the green one. Well, it's because it was different than the others. If it was a slight variation on amber, it would have blended in. So what happens here is this. Our definition for branding is this, the art of differentiation. I developed this definition after looking, I went to Amazon out of curiosity one day. I typed in branding and searched under books. At the time, I think there were over 6,300 results. That's books, over 6,000 books. Now, we're not talking about romance. We're not talking about dating. We're not talking about how to lose weight. Okay, all of those I would expect to have large volumes of books. But branding, this is a specific tool. I could dig it if there were a few hundred or even as much as a thousand, but over 6,000 books. Well, if you're interested in, in books, go ahead and read the 6,000 books. Or if you value your time like I do, here's a four word definition for you. It's the art of differentiation. You differentiate with everything from how you sound, how you talk, how you taste, how you smell, the kinds of imagery that you choose, the colors that you choose, the style that you choose, you should be uniquely you and not a, a, a shade of one of your competitors. So, would you like to see some examples of presentation caffeine? Let's do it. Very good. Well, that, here we go. Now, these are examples, actual examples for clients. Just to, so I'm walking you through these so you get the idea. So this is for a water. Now, water is an interesting space. Water, you know, there's Dasani, there's Aquafina. Those are kind of sort of like common man's water. And then you got smart water. Then you've got um, Fiji. And then you have other different specialty kind of different waters, this and that, the other, and ones that have electrolytes and ones that have other alkaline, you know, certain pH. Well, these guys had come to me and they had created a water that was very, very targeted. It was specifically for the athletic, the athlete. Now, the thing about this is I could have taken a very, very dumb approach which would have ignored the points that I'm raising. It could have, would have ignored purpose. It would have ignored interest. It would have ignored cliches and noise, but I didn't. And here's how this message was told. Anybody can show up. Wear the right gear. 
of the park. But the real question is, who's the last one standing? The one who takes home the trophy. The one they want to beat next year. It's me. Me. The one who crushed it. Me. The beast. The one who bounced back and dominated. To all the big companies with their fancy slogans and multi-million dollar campaigns. I'm not some target audience or some ad agency's demographic. I'm not some cash cow to fill with salt, chemicals, corn syrup. I want. No. I demand fuel. Not some marketable candy flavored formula. No. I want fuel to burn. After all, I've conditioned my body for crushing it. For beast mode. For coming out of nowhere. Bouncing back like a force of nature you never saw coming. Being the player my coach, trainer, and teammates know and respect. Why? Because respect isn't something you're born with. It's something you earn. Every day. Defiance fuel. Earth's first water formulated for athletic performance. Defy limitation. So the whole thing with that was it was connecting to their purpose. And what we found, I had to use the corny flame um, treatment on the on this number because they found they were getting a 100% close rate. And is this connected to the purpose? If you look at the, at the way the script told the story, it talked about, you know, it's me, the beast. You know, I'm not some just some target, the target audience who wants some, some of your sugar flavored blah, 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 blah. So it took, it became the voice and the purpose of the athlete. Otherwise it would have been in what I call pitch mode. It would have been talking at the actual, the actual athlete. Instead it became the voice of the athlete and they went nuts. From the name, and if, if your person is still listening with regard to the naming, that this grew out of understanding our audience. Nobody else actually had this either, but defiance fuel and defy limitation was their mantra. And so to also breathe life into the story, this is what, these are some other pieces to the story. And all of this applies to a presentation as well as creating a brand because there, you, you really can't separate the two. If you have a great story, you'll have a great brand. If you have a great brand, you have a great story. So, and these, let me give you an example. This is a series of posters. The purpose of me showing you the posters is none of these are sitting here showing a product shot. All right, who cares about the product shot? What they care about is being able to be in that moment that's theirs where they can do things like this or like this or this. So it celebrated their purpose, the things they were passionate about. That's how we told our story by showing the respect and understanding of their story. And you should notice there's never an excuse not to have fun. Please notice the upside down logo in the bottom right corner. So did you notice how the message was, it was interested, right? how the message owned their purpose, how we avoided cliches, and how it was done in a way that didn't add to the noise. It had its own unique message. This gives you an example of a different type of business. And I'm sure I picked a few different types of business so that it could be clear to anyone watching that this is for anybody in terms of, I don't care whether you have a business that's a service or a product or a revolutionary idea, it doesn't matter. Now this is an example of a company. This is what they had before, Millennium. Now, let me, it was the question about naming was mentioned, so I'll bring this up. 
I never want to choose a word that people have difficulty spelling. I can guarantee you if I went out in the street and I asked people how to spell millennium, a uh, hundred people, probably 98% would get it wrong. They either have one L or one N or, or both, and they act a tough thing. And it doesn't add to the message because what this company is doing is they're providing companies like John Deere um, market research. So what we created was this, landmark performance. And the thing about this is that we found that performance is what they were about. And since they're dealing with stuff that has to do with the earth and, and agricultural products, unearthing product potential, landmark, landmark performance group, it was a much better name. And to tell their story, this gives you an example of how we told their story. Whoever said it was about the journey never ran a business. In business, it's about arriving. More than that, it's about arriving faster, savvier, and smarter than the competition. That's how today's market leaders thrive. It's no longer an issue of collecting facts. It's about digging deep enough to unearth insights and open the door to something meaningful. How does one navigate through this rough terrain of discovery? With the same old tools? No. By learning to see through the eyes of those familiar with the terrain. By learning to hear what they hear. And say, Unearth unarticulated needs that redefine a category or correct buyer perceptions. You need an unusual skill set, so what you say and do in the market strikes like lightning. If you combine a laser precise focus with the ability to cut through the crap, with a relentless yet cool exterior, powered by a souped up V8 under the hood, you'd probably be getting close to our approach real close. Dumb questions never yielded smart answers. That's why we're fond of getting our hands dirty, as long as it's in the ongoing pursuit of getting potent insights that transform you and your product into superheroes. The kind of superhero with really awesome superpowers. What kind of powers? The kind that make products fly off the shelf. We don't care if people call us names behind our backs. Names like genius, clairvoyant, Jedi-like mind readers, whatever. As long as you say this to our face, you helped us finally understand our product distinctions and buyer's values, and now we're selling product like hotcakes. That's right, hotcakes. Sound real yummy right about now. And so it is. Let's talk. So the message was interested, right? The message owned the viewer's purpose. We avoided cliches and we refused to add to the noise. Those are the things.
if you looked at it, what would, what was what were we talking about in that message? We were talking about the the needs, the values, the purposes, the what the what their client liked. It wasn't saying, "Hey, look, let us tell you about us. Let us tell you about us. Look, we're you know, hey, we do this great, that we do that great." Da, 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 da. No, we talked about their pains, their obstacles, their frustrations. That's how it worked. So. We've got the before. This is American Dance Institute. Now, this was a cliche. We've got American Dance Institute. That looked 25 years out of date, and it was appropriate because they had their 25th, 25th anniversary, and they came to us to do a, to do a rebrand. This was the rebrand. Now, the thing is, is that he, their audience had purposes. You need to know your audience. That's the whole thing of presentations. It was movement on your terms. The way all dance, the way all of these particular dance schools and dance uh, in the area, they were all saying the same type of thing and they all had a, a way about them. They were very authoritative. They were very um, disciplinarian. So here's what we did as far as telling their story. Some say dance isn't for everyone, but what if it were? What if there was a community built on the joy and freedom of dance? What if there was an oasis, an institution that had one reason for being, that recognition of our inherent right to dance, to express ourselves? What if movement looked to us for guidance? What if movement wasn't something to be feared but something that celebrated our arrival, welcoming us with open arms and an open heart. What if movement opened our eyes to a new world that applauded us with every gesture and flourish? What if there were such a place? Well, there is. It's where dance has called home for the last 25 years and where future dancers will call home for the next 25. American Dance Institute. Movement on your terms. Come in and together, let's discover the magic of you. So again, you see the story that's being told there. And that's that, and this is how it comes to life in the real world. And I'm talking branding and purpose, right? Branding and purpose. What are the things that are gonna get your audience engaged? Here's an example of a, of a series of shirts that were created as part of this. Rules were meant to be broken, not dancers. Dedicated to less left feet and more right ones. When in doubt, I dance. It drives serious adults crazy. And more pounds per ounce. So again, purpose. So were we interested? Yes, we were. Did we own the viewer's problems? Yes, we did. Did we avoid cliches? Yes. And did we bypass the noise? Yes. We didn't sound like everybody else. Everybody else they're talking about different things. We talked about, we talked about the factor of movement on your terms. You could be whatever weight, whatever skill level, whatever age, it didn't matter. That was an example.
now. So that is in the instructional space. This is in the product space with regard to coffee, okay? Coffee, talk about a noisy category, right? right. You've got everything from Starbucks to Pete's to the independence to the third wave. You got all this stuff going on. You got Caribou, all of these different brands. So Dunn Brothers comes to us and basically they want to refine their story. And we found that there was an actual reason that somehow everybody overlooked. So here's what we did as far as telling their story. It's been on my mind lately. I've been thinking about it a lot, actually. Is coffee just a drink? Or is it a pastime? Or an art form? Or a contest? Or a business? You know, some sit and ponder whether it's a science or an art. We tend to think of coffee and approach it as something entirely different. To us, it's about taste, about flavor, and about a passion that's been perfected since 1987. A passion for the ultimate convenience that's as fresh as it is real. For basking in the joy of life, its flavors, its aromas, its freshness, and taking in all that life has to offer. For those who want to sit back and take a moment to savor life's delicious pleasures, we're all in. And like a friendly embrace, we couldn't do it without you. This obsession with taste is why none of our independent operators use automatic machines, since no push-button solution could ever replace the handcrafted nuances of flavor and aroma, and why the beans we sell are never roasted more than five days ago. So, whether it's a cup full of taste, a shot of goodness, a bowl of deliciousness, a plate of awesomeness or a reward just for the heck of it dunn brothers coffee life's rewards done right the official home of taste and the point was and this is a very important lesson for you to know. Don't ever overestimate or underestimate the obvious. The obvious tends to be overlooked by a lot of people. No one in the coffee space actually simply owned taste. So we made it the official home of taste. Nobody owned it. You would think that's insane. And it pretty much is insane. The basic thing about it is that when you're developing that story, that brand presentation, you're developing that, or that arc for your story, that is what you want to really, really look for. What, where can you, uni you uniquely shine? So, so how do we use these? You know, we had interest. We had ownership of their problem. It's like, you know, so we're going to make it the official home of taste. Not just someplace you can go for taste. Anybody can say that, but, but we made the official home of it. If, if no one else is going to be the official home, we're going to claim, stake our claim. So, the last one I've in this series is, this is for the skin space. Now, very competitive. Skincare is very, very competitive. So how do we do this? Now, this is a, this is a play on words, undo, and you'll see how it actually, what it actually means in, this is the packaging as an example, but this little video tells you. The beautiful things in life, they're what we each seek. They're what move each of us forward. And they're the best of us. And well worth protecting. Very simply, these factors are what inspired us to create something that was luxurious, effective, elegant, and simple. Like beauty itself. All in recognition of those qualities that celebrate vitality, life, and the spark of youth. 
our creation, undo. Let's defy the odds. Let's dare to shine. Undo what you don't want. Take back what you do. I remember showing this to at an international convention and someone gave this, uh, someone had stood up and gave it a standing ovation because they were shocked at how a skincare product could be done with no visuals. I mean, again, let's look at cliches. Let's look at different points. No visuals of women looking beautiful and photoshopped and airbrushed and all this kind of stuff. No, no the normal, the, none of the usual suspects and instead painted the message with regard to, un, you know, basically take back what you want. You know, undo, undo what you don't want, take back what you do. And so undo was that. So you start to see this pattern with regard to interest, ownership, and cliches and noise. They're all related to purpose. That's the basic thing about that. So I've driven this point home. Those four things, you use those, and you own those in your presentation, in your storyline. When you're doing a presentation, you're telling a story. You don't walk me through and engage me with each of those particular points. You've lost me. Now, here's the thing. I wanted to make sure about this. On this, if you found this valuable, I, I'm inviting you to basically, there's a free ebook that you can get, take a screenshot or do whatever you want to do at that bottom there. That is what you, where you can basically go and download this free ebook. It's a, an ebook that was previously available only to clients, and we've made it available to anybody. I wanted to thank you for an incredible uh, webinar, and I look forward to to uh, you know continuing the relationship. Thank you. Absolutely, absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. And if anybody if anybody has any other questions that they didn't get to ask, feel my email is right at the bottom of the screen here. Feel free to reach out. And um, and thank you guys for being an attentive audience. I hope that you got a lot out of this. It's my goal to actually you know provide you with value. So there you go, and I look forward to speaking with you and Alex. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Absolutely.